All righty, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, if you're a visitor with us this evening, we are so glad to have you here with us. And we are honored guests, and we invite you back at any opportunity you may have. Our first song this evening will be number 346, if you're using the books. Number 346. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever it may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me.
scripture reading tonight will be brought from Psalms 23. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of doubt, I, feel, I, will, feel, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Bow with me. Holy Father, we're grateful for the Lord's day. We're thankful that on this day we can gather as your children in this place, praise your name, give you thanks for all the blessings you provide to us daily, and to seek forgiveness of sin in our life. We're grateful, Father, that we can come and sing these songs of praise, lifting up your name. We're grateful that we can come as an assembly to ask for forgiveness of sin in our life, we're thankful, Father, that we can hear your word read and be encouraged. We're thankful that we can hear a message from your word that will enlighten our hearts and help us to learn more of your will for us in this life. We're thankful, Father, that we could come together on this day to partake of the Lord's Supper, to reflect upon the suffering of our Lord to remember his body that was given for us. Tremendous sacrifice beyond our comprehension. Such an important time we've spent today to praise your name and to give you thanks. And we pray, Father, in this service tonight that that spirit will continue, that we will reflect upon your goodness toward us, your goodness toward our land, your will in our life that we may learn about tonight. We pray, Father, that we will indeed be blessed by our worship together. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark the song of invitation, it will be number 922. Number 922. And before our lesson, let's sing number 410. 410. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort.
Good evening. I'm so thankful to be here to uh, see all of my church family, to see the Ripley Church of Christ. I'm so thankful uh, for the elders, for Cody, for Donnie, for allowing me to speak tonight, for also having this internship with the youth. Um, and I'm also thankful just to be here preaching God's Word. And tonight, in God's Word, we are looking at John chapter 10. If you would turn to John chapter 10, and to give you a little context to this, there is this blind uh, beggar, and he is, uh, he's blind of course, but uh, Jesus is going to heal this man, and there's these Pharisees, and they're going to uh, throw him out of the synagogue, and Jesus hears about this in verse 35 of chapter 9, and he sees him and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He says, who is he, so that I might believe in him? Jesus said, you have seen him now. And in fact, he is the one who you are talking to. The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come to this world, so that the blind will see, and those who, are, uh, who see will become blind. And the Pharisees, they're over there wondering, what, what is going on here? <laughs> are, are we blind too? Can we not see? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not uh, be guilty of sin. But now that you say that you see, uh, you claim that you see your guilt remains. And this kind of leads us into chapter 10. And Jesus is going to talk about these false prophets, these Pharisees. And um, before we get into that, though, Ezekiel even prophesies this. Uh, in Ezekiel 34, uh, verses 1 to 6, uh, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not the shepherds take care of the flock? You eat curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they had scattered, uh, they had become food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over the mountains on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth. And no one searched or looked for them. And we enter our text and we see Jesus is about to talk about these false teachers, these Pharisees and these people are not taking care of the flock. They're not taking care of these sheep. And they only sought to destroy Jesus and discredit his teaching. And Jesus is here. He tells a story. He tells a story that the Jews would recognize, but he gives us hidden meaning behind it. He is trying to show them uh, something in particular to relate to this, to show their falsehood. So let's read in verse 1 of chapter 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls him his own sheep. Uh, he calls his sheep uh, by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away, from his, uh, run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus is saying this allegory to show this hidden meaning that he will reveal to them. He is trying to hide this true meaning to show that they truly are blind. And they can't see... Uh, what is being said here. Not because they're physically blind, but because they are not willing to see. So, we read in verse 7. Therefore Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers. But, I, I, <laughs> but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus explains what he's trying to say. He says, I am the gate. I am the door, as other translations say. And this picture that Donnie gave me on text the other day, uh, it shows perfectly kind of what this sheep pen or sheep fold would look like. You have all these uh, rocks surrounding the sheep, and Jesus, the shepherd, is there. This shepherd is going to be your gate, your gatekeeper and your shepherd. He is going to sit there, guard the sheep. He is going to protect them from your wolves, your lions, your bears. He is going to protect us, us, the sheep, from all these false prophets, all these Pharisees. Um, and we even see a similar situation with David. David, which is also a shepherd, uh, in 1 Samuel 17, 34-35, uh, he says to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a, a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And I think this is exactly how we're going to see Jesus. He's going to find us in the mouth of a lion. And he's going to try to pull us out because he is our shepherd. And now going on into verse 8, we see that all who have come before him are these thieves and robbers. They only come to steal and kill the sheep. But who are these people? These are the Pharisees uh, in this context. And they try to climb in a different way. As you'll see, the lions, bears, and wolves try for this. But really, the only way they can attack is going to be at the shepherd. And our shepherd is going to defend uh, for our sake. But... They did not enter through the sheep pen um, by the gate. But Jesus continues to say, I am the gate. Whoever enters my gate will be saved. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. You don't have to worry whenever you follow Jesus and enter into his gate because, the, uh, because he's always there for us whenever the false prophets are trying to teach us differently. Number two, we see that Jesus is the good shepherd. Let's read on in verse 11 uh, through uh, 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep. He runs away. He runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So first off, we see that Jesus leads the sheep. If we go back to verse 2, in verse 2 it says, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. We see that Jesus is here to lead his sheep uh, through this gate, and he stays with the sheep at all times. As we see in, uh, let me see, in this, he's going to stay with them at all times, through the night, through the day. He is going to protect us, us as sheep. David also writes about this. As Cooper read to us, as Cole sung to us, uh, we saw that the Lord is my shepherd. And David's writing here as a shepherd. David the shepherd writes, talking about God, 
being a shepherd and us being the sheep. And he says, by the way that he lies us down, the way he leads us out of the quiet waters, the way he guides us along the right paths, the way he protects us from evil, this is to show how much God cares for us. It's to show that he cares about his sheep by leading us to good instead of evil. But he not only leads his sheep, he lays down his life for his sheep. We see this many times, five times to be exact, but uh, he says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. But then we see the hired man. The hired man does not care. He is just paid to be there watching. But when that wolf comes, he's about to scurry off. He's about to run. But Jesus, Jesus stays with us. Jesus doesn't let that wolf take us. He protects us. So, this is just like how the Pharisees, we see the Pharisees, they see this blind man that tries to believe in a prophet healed him. And now we know that he, was, uh, he sees Jesus and believes in Jesus and worships Jesus. But before that, we see that the Pharisees kick him out. Jesus would not kick us out. Jesus keeps us close. He keeps us close because he knows his sheep. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. As verse 3 says, He knew his father and his father knew him. He cared for his sheep just like the blind man and he healed him. Uh, the good shepherd knew his sheep and they recognized his voice. But the sheep did not recognize the voice of strangers. It was just strange to think about. They ran from it. But what's that reason? The reason they do this is because uh, they fear their shep or they do not fear their shepherd. They hear his voice every day. They see him. They've known him for a long while. They grew up with this guy. But whenever they see someone else, they run from it because they know it's a stranger. They know it's not the teachings and the uh, uh, right truth. They know it's falsehood. They know that's not my true shepherd. That's not my good shepherd. And they run from it. They flock together and run away. So he repeats in, uh, again like what he said in verse 11. He would lay his life down for these sheep. He says, I lay my life down for the sheep. And he tra transitions the saying from good, uh, the good shepherd lays his life down to I. I know my sheep. I lay my life down for my sheep. And then he goes on to say, that he must bring in these outsiders. These outside sheep, they're wandering around, and they're just lost. And he is saying that he has other sheep of the flock that aren't in this pen, and they could be taken by these wolves, these lions, these uh, bears. And back in Ezekiel 34, if we look back in that, uh, he said that the sheep were wandering all over the mountains and every hill, and they were scattered over... Um, over the whole earth, and no one was searching for them. Well, who wasn't searching for them? These false prophets weren't. These hired men weren't. Uh, these people that just don't care about you. They won't search for you. They won't look for you. But Jesus, Jesus does. Contrasting uh, to this idea of uh, he won't seek us, the Pharisees won't seek us. In Ezekiel verse 11, uh, 34, 11, he says, The sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep, and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. Jesus said he must bring these sheep in. It is a desire, and it is a want, and it is a must. I have to bring these sheep in. They are outsiders. They are lost, and I need them. But then a third time, moving on, he says that he must lay his life down. The shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. The five times he says, the good shepherd lays his life down in verse 11. Verse 15, I lay my life down for the sheep. And the reason my father uh, loves me is that I lay my life down for my sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Verse 18, I have the authority to lay it down. This is very significant. If you think about the sheep in the old days, you see they were sacrificed. They would not, uh, they would die uh, for their shepherd, usually. You would see that the shepherd would be willing to die for their sheep. I mean, that's their life. The sheep are their life. 
But this is a little bit different. We see the good shepherd, he is going to lay his life down for his sheep. We deserve to die. We deserve to be sacrificed in tradition. And now we see that our great Savior died for us. He laid his life down for us so that this Old Testament tradition of sacrificing less sheep was over. The good shepherd was the final sacrifice, that lamb to the slaughter that purchased the sheep with his own blood so that we might live. But just as there is the death, there is the resurrection. His voluntary death was followed up by a victorious resurrection. And just as Christ was raised, we are also to be raised in baptism, as Paul says in Romans 6. And he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that our grace may increase? God forbid. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of his Father, we may too have a new life. Jesus died and was raised, and he, was, he, give, he gave us a way to live a new life. And just as he died, we are to die to our sins, our old life, and to put on Christ in baptism, and to be raised out of that water so that we can start living for Christ but Peter said it best about resurrection. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power into the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. At the end of the section in verses 19 to 21, we see that their crowd is separated. There's the unbelievers and the believers. And we see that the unbelievers, they're like, Jesus is this guy that is demon-possessed. He is a deceiver. He's crazy. What is this guy doing here trying to teach us what's right when he doesn't know what he's talking about? But the truth is, he didn't know what he was talking about. The believers said, how could this be that he could heal these people? How could he be saying all this um, if he's a demon? How can he open the eyes of the blind if he's a demon? He can't if he's a demon. Do we seek some Savior that's not our Lord? Do we seek some political uh, Savior that's from the earth? Or do we seek the one that is here for us eternally, everlasting? He is going to stay with us to the end of our life and forever into our new life. He cares about us. He gave His life for us. He leads us to the gate. But what are we going to... What, how are we going to follow Him? Are we going to follow Him? He knows His sheep, but do we know Him? He brings in outsiders, but... Do we try to help the, him bring these outsiders in? He laid down his life for us, but are we willing to give our lives? Uh, are we living, give up our lives in service for him? Jesus has done all these great things for us, so how can we follow him? First, we see that just like sheep, we need to listen to God, our shepherd. We need to continue to hear his voice through the scriptures, through all these words that have been heard by him written by him too. Uh, we need to start believing since God uh, loved the world so much that he gave his life for us, us believers. He gave his son's uh, life so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We need to turn away from our sins. We need to turn to God so that our sins may be blotted out, wiped out, and then we need to confess the great name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Finally, we need to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Being buried with Him through baptism into death in order that as He was raised, we may too live a new life. And just like sheep, 
follow their shepherd. We too must follow Christ the rest of our lives. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, 24, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up your cross and follow me. If you have any need to be baptized or to turn your life for Christ, we have a family right here. If you have any need right now, please come to the front as we stand and sing. Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I hold. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Thank Caleb for doing a good job tonight, and thank Cody for doing a good job last week. We're so thankful that we have all of these young men that have done such a great job for us over the summer, giving the Wednesday night devotional, young men and older men too, sorry, didn't mean to leave you out, uh, but we appreciate all of these men that have done such a great job for us on Wednesday night, and we want to have a meal to honor these men to celebrate them and all the good things that they have done. And we're going to enjoy that meal over in the fellowship hall in just a little bit. But before we do, I wanted to talk for just a second about what makes a good sermon. What makes for a good sermon? A few months ago, I invited one of my mentors to come to Fried Hardman and to address the preaching students and to speak on what makes for a good sermon. And so I asked him to come and he said, well, here it is. You need to have a good beginning, a good ending, and you need to keep those two things as close together as possible. And I'm thinking, you know, I was hoping for a little more than that. And so as I thought on that just a little bit more, I developed it, and it turns out that it is really good advice. The secret, I believe, to a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending and to keep those two things as close together as possible. Sermons begin... Because God has spoken. All scripture is inspired of God. All sermons then should end as well with this solemn realization that God has spoken. As Moses said over in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do all of this law that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. You see, sermons have this good beginning in Scripture and they have this good ending, the ending with the realization that God has spoken. God speaks in Scripture and His voice therefore echoes in the hearts of the congregation when the sermon is preached. The preached word then serves as a life-giving connection from God to his people. Men live, after all, on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is why in Scripture, and especially since the Reformation, we have recognized that the preaching of the word is one of the essential marks of the church. So sermons begin in Scripture. Sermons begin with the realization that God has spoken. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, You have known the Holy Scriptures, therefore preach the Word. 
Preaching occurs because God has spoken. To preach then is to receive and then echo the message that God has given. One of the foremost preaching scholars today is a man by the name of Abraham Caravilla. And he says that preaching is an extension of the divine utterance, an amplified echo that carries God's word to God's people. Sermons then arise as the text is received, examined, and shared. This is why the preacher must, first of all, be saturated with the text. I usually advise my students to read the, the passage that they will preach, to read it maybe a hundred times, so that once they are saturated with the text, they will be able then to deliver what the text says. As the greatest preaching scholar of a generation ago, Haddon Robinson, says, that every sermon is built upon the text subject and then the text complement. In other words, the text is about something and then it explains about that something. And so anytime you are looking at a text of Scripture, you should look for what the text says, and then you should look for how the text is telling you that. You look for that main thesis that's in the text, and then you reveal the main points that God has already in the text. Beyond this, you simply discover what the text says or implies about God, humanity, salvation, ethics, and future glory. This then is your sermon. It is not coming up with something, it's not imagining, it's echoing what God has said. In this way then, we keep the end close to the beginning. The sermon finds its beginning in the revelatory work of God and Scripture. But the end of the sermon then should reestablish the congregation's awareness of being in the presence of God. The sermon exists because God has spoken, and the congregation exists because God has summoned them to himself. As Spurgeon says, that in preaching we are just mirrors reflecting the transactions of Calvary, telescopes manifesting the distant glories of an exalted Redeemer. The sermon's conclusion then just calls the congregation to action. Called to action in the presence of God. The sermon is not just informative, neither is it just entertaining. But instead, the sermon is a sacred, life-changing act of worship. God works through the scripture preached to accomplish his purpose. As going back to Kira Villa, he says, Biblical preaching is the communication of the thrust of a paragraph of scripture discerned by theological exegesis and of its application to that specific body of believers that they may be conformed to the image of Christ for the glory of God. This is why we preach, isn't it? We preach because God has spoken. And we end with the realization that God has spoken. So then, preaching, as we look at it in this way, is both temporal and eternal. Preaching identifies God's people, calls God's people, and is used to save those who would be God's people. Preaching then has eternal effects. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, and as we see in Romans 10 and verse 14, how are they to hear without a preacher? Christians, we must then follow the Apostle Paul as we're preaching. We must labor to proclaim him, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Christians, we continue the sacred work of preaching because God promised his word, preached his word would not return to him void. Christians, as you continue to preach, keep the end of your sermon near the beginning. Remember that you are there because God has spoken. Remember the congregation is there because God has spoken. And I believe we'll all be blessed because God has spoken. Let's pray. Our God, we are thankful that you have spoken and that you have give, given us the opportunity to share your word, to echo your word to congregations. Father, we are thankful for each one of our men who have preached for their labors in studying and their work in delivery. And Father, we are thankful that we are confident that you work through that preached word. We are thankful, Lord, that we have the opportunity tonight 
to provide honor to those to whom honor is due, to celebrate especially these young men, but all of the men who have done such a great job for us. Father, we are thankful for them. We praise you for the work that they have done and for the word that they have preached. Father, we pray your blessings upon them in the future, that they will continue to share your gospel with others. Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless this church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a few, <clears throat> just have a few announcements as we close out service tonight. Um, uh, we're proud to announce the birth of Amelia Page Gray. This is the daughter of Barrett and Dana Gray. She was born July the 21st. The grandparents are Billy and Regina Morton and great-grandfather Jack Gardner. Uh, let's continue to remember Carson Meeks as she has her upcoming surgery on August the 1st. Um, let's continue to remember Billy McBride as he begins uh, cancer treatments. Uh, this is, of course, Laura Green's father. Uh, also need to remember Kathy Hurst's sister, Jan Rooker, as she begins cancer treatments. And we're also uh, asked to announce or to pray for Lennox Kennemore. This is the son of Ricky and Tracy Kennemore as he begins uh, treatments for leukemia. So let's continue to remember all these in our prayers. Uh, let's also remember our summer speaker series that will begin August uh, in August each Wednesday night. Uh, so let's remember the upcoming uh, 5K that will be at the church building on August the 13th. August the 13th. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for any, anyone that's willing to help. And also, if you'd like to participate, you can sign up through our website. Uh, also, let's remember Fred Moore of Tippersville. He passed away yesterday. Let's remember that family. Also, the young men of the congregation will conduct our afternoon services next Sunday night on July the 31st. Uh, the August worksheet list is up in the office if you'd like to take a look at that. If you are unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, it has been prepared, left prepared for you. You can exit the building at this time, the auditorium this time, and go to your right. And the last building, our last room on the left, someone will be there to assist you. That's all the announcements I have. Turn it over to Cole. We'll sing the first verse, number 417, and have our closing prayer. Sweet are the promises, kindness to work. 